So what have we done so far? Let's recap a little bit before I go to the slides. We said that uh, our data is gonna be our source code for deep learning. Then we came up with models, which could be large network, which has only one objective of maximizing the accuracy, or you can design your network to have two objectives in mind, to be as accurate as possible, and at the same time be efficient when you want to store them, when you want to put them on smaller devices like drones, etc., your cell phones. This was a human doing the work, coming up with the model. We can actually automate that using AutoML. So whatever that you do, you start with the data, then you come up with a model, then you train the model, which is basically compiling it using a stochastic gradient descent. Once you do that, you're gonna end up with an executable code that you can use it in production. But if you want to use that in production, your network has to be robust. You don't want it to be prone to adversarial attacks. You want your network to be as robust as possible, to make as few mistakes as possible. And now it's time to go back. If we saw that the network is not robust, if we saw that the network is making mistakes on particular types of images or on particular type of examples, then it's time to debug. We have to debug our code. And if you want to debug it, you have to take a look at your data set and at the same time, take a look at your network, what's happening inside it. So now it's time to open the black box and try to understand what the network is doing, what is it looking at, and how is it making decisions. So that's why it's important to be able to visualize and understand what the network is doing. So yes, these are really important topics. It's time to debug. And we are gonna cover a couple of papers. It's a huge literature. I'm not gonna have time. We are not gonna have time to study all of them, but some of you are gonna be really interested and are gonna become expert in this field. Let's start with the first paper that tried to look at convolutional neural networks and try to understand and visualize it. This paper came right after ImageNet. So their architecture is gonna be exactly ImageNet architecture. Sorry, it's gonna be AlexNet architecture. And they're gonna make some improvements on that architecture. One is that rather than using filter size of 11, they're gonna use a filter size of seven. And rather than having a stride of four, they're gonna have a stride of two. But how did they come up with these changes? It's not random. They actually took a look at their network and their data to make these two changes and managed to improve the results, the accuracy over AlexNet. But how are you gonna take a look at the features in your network? Forget about this part for now. Let's take a look at the upside. This part should be easy for you. There is a layer below your pooled maps. Actually, it's layer below pooled maps. These are, there was a pooled operation and it's giving you a bunch of features. Now in this layer, you're gonna do a convolution. It's gonna give you a bunch of feature maps. You take those feature maps, you apply ReLU on it, your activation function. You're gonna end up with some rectified feature maps. Then you're gonna do a max pooling. It's gonna give you your pooled maps that you're gonna take to the next layer. So it's as if uh, you can keep continue com keep continuing this figure. So it's gonna have a very similar structure from that point on and below it, it has a very similar structure. So this is what we were doing all the time. In AlexNet, we actually took a look at the weights and actually our filters and we plotted them. Now we want to actually take a look at the feature maps. Because of these pooled operations, they're gonna have a lower resolution. That's one observation. But uh, they're gonna have a structure similar to an image. They're gonna have some resolution, a height and a width, and it's gonna have a couple of channels. We are gonna pick one of those channels and we want to visualize that. And that channel could be the most active channel. You can take a look at the sum of the activation and that's gonna give you the most active channel. You have C channels, you can pick the most active one and try to visualize that. So how are we gonna do that? There is a pooled operation here, pooling operation with some stride. And let's say your stride is two. And now it's time to take a look at this figure down here. So this is exactly when you're doing max pooling. And this is when we are doing max pooling here. We are doing max pooling with a stride of two. So we take windows of size two by two and then a stride to the next one. 
So we are sliding a window of two by two with a stride of two. In this blue region, the maximum activation is here. When you do pulling, that's gonna go here. This is the maximum one. You're gonna pull it, you're gonna put it here, etc. But when you do that, you also store these locations of the maximums. And that's actually these maximums. For instance, in the red region, this was the maximum value. We are gonna store the index. In the green region, this is where the index of the maximum was. So we're gonna store that, etc. So these are gonna be called our switches. Now we go back here, these are our switches. From layer above, there is some reconstruction coming in and we want to do a max unpooling operation here because these feature maps have a lower resolution and we want to increase the resolution, go to the image and then plot that activation in the image space. We want to unpool. When you want to unpool from the layer above, these were the values. You copy those values and paste them in the correct location according to your switches. So the switches are gonna give you the locations. And this is how you are gonna do max pooling. The rest of it is zero. Then you're gonna do a rectified linear activation on that. Then the rest of it is just another convolution, but there is no training going on here. You take the filter from your convolution and you transpose it. And that's gonna give you a deconvolution. In the end, you're gonna get a reconstruction and you keep repeating that until you reach the space of your input image. So no training is gonna go on. These values you're gonna know and you're able to increase the resolution from one layer to the next one in your deconvolution, deconvolent layer. Is the goal on the left-hand side just to do the, the inverse of a neural network? Like take an output classification and backpropagate it or um, like feed it back through the network to figure out what kind of image induced that class? Uh, you're right. So it's gonna be a backward. It's exactly in your computational graph when you have a convolution you're doing a forward operation. So is back propagation, you're going to end up with F transpose. Okay, so con convolving with F transpose is the inverse of the forward convolution? Yes. And then with this rectified linear function on the backwards side, are we doing like an, an inverse, inverse rectified function? And the reason is that you want the values to be positive. When you come here, you want your values to be positive. Got it. And then last question, in general, do we store these max locations anyway, or is this just specific to this paper where you're trying to visualize the, the activation? Do you, don't you need the max locations when you're doing back propagation through max pooling? When you're doing the, um, the, the gradients, don't they depend on the location of where the maximum occurred? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a question. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this, but I'm trying to follow this figure on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And why do the the bars switch? Like, why does the yellow and green have dark, like, scores, I guess? Why is it dark gray there? This is coming from the layer above. So it's a reconstruction from the layer above. It's similar to here. Once you do your operations in deconvnet, you're going to end up with a bunch of reconstructions that are going to go to the next layer, which is a similar pattern to here. So that's a great observation and they have different values. So it's not these values, it's some other different values done coming from the convolution from layer above. Okay, so it's showing that it's like an approximation that you're not gonna recover it exactly. No, you're not gonna. These switches are the only thing that you're gonna copy and paste from the forward pass to the backward pass in addition to your convolution filter because you need to transpose it. So the idea of the network was this, uh, the back propagation, is going to be uh, corresponding to a deconvolution. So it's the inverse of your forward pass. It's going to give you the backward pass. But then the problem was the resolution, and the resolution you're going to handle it by memorizing where these maximum happens. Any other questions? And this convolutional filtering is just flipping each filter vertically and horizontally. That's what this operation is. We are going to learn more about the convolutions later on. But for now, this should be good enough that it's a transpose. And the problem is always this case that you start with a high resolution image and you keep shrinking the resolution. You make it smaller and smaller. Now you have to recover it back, which you can do using the convolutions and max, pooling, max on pooling using these switches. So what do you get? Why did the paper decide to modify AlexNet and make the following two modifications, make the strike two and make the filter size seven? 
rather than 11. So what you are seeing here is a visualization of the first feature, the features of the first layer for AlexNet. It looks a little bit blurry because there is probably one feature that is dominating the values. So the rest of them are uh, looking smaller compared to that value. The other observation is that you have a lot of dead feature maps. So these are all dead feature maps. So that was one observation in the first layer. If you plot the feature maps of the second layer, you again see a lot of dead features like here, and you don't see much pattern. But now compare this to when you are using stride of two and a stride and a filter size of seven. Those dead feature maps are gone. So you don't see many dead feature maps. All of them are colorful. It means that there is no single feature map that's dominating. That's for the first layer. And for the second layer, the features of the second layer, you start to see more pattern and you don't have that uh, dead features anymore. So what is the idea? Visualizing your feature maps is going to help you modify your network. And that's exactly what this paper did. The rest of the paper is exact. The rest of the architecture in this paper is exactly AlexNet, except for the first layer. Smaller stride and filter size of seven. And we know that after this paper, uh, most of the networks are sticking to a stride of two and seven by seven for the first layer. We saw that when we were covering large networks in this class. And the next one is very interesting. So far, we were looking at the architecture. We can actually take a look at your data. But before we do that, let's take a look at a visualization of layer five of our network. This is layer five. This is the strongest feature map, which is basically you're summing the activations of all of your neurons, the activations of all of your pixels. These are gonna give you C numbers, C is a number of channels, and you pick the maximum of that. That's gonna be your strongest feature map. And we are at layer five. And because we are at layer five, we are going to be able to see more patterns about the class. In, uh, in layers one up until two, three, or five, you are seeing general patterns. I mean, there is an edge, there is a color. But as you go deeper, you're going to start seeing patterns that correspond to your label. This box here is corresponding to this image. And we see that the network or the strongest feature map is focusing on the face of that dog. These other um, visualizations are for other plots of similar images, of similar docs. So it's not for this image. This box here corresponds to this image, but the rest of it doesn't. The strongest feature map is focusing on a letter and a number when it comes to this car. The strongest feature map in layer five is focusing on the face of the woman here. And these are visualizations of other uh, cases, other examples. But what is nice about this paper is that you can actually take a look at your input image. You can put a box which is going to occlude part of your image. So we are hiding some parts of the image. And we are going to take that box and slide it over the image to specify, to understand what is the most important part for that particular image. We know that from the visualization that it's probably the face of the dog. But let's see if it's actually the case. As you keep sliding that occlusion over your image and you keep plotting the strongest feature map, you see that most of the activation are here and the activation is going to drop suddenly if you slide the box over the face of your dock. If you look at the classifier probability for the correct class, as you slide your window over the image, you're still with 90% accuracy classifying that dock correctly. But as soon as that box goes over the face of the dog, it's going to get classified incorrectly. The probability of the correct class drops. And if you look at the most probable class, as you keep sliding that box over your window, it's going to become classified as the dog if you're sliding any place other than the face of the dog. But then uh, as soon as you occlude that, it's going to get classified as a tennis ball or a Peking Z, etc. A similar exercise is happening here. And this is an anomaly because the network is focusing on the face, but uh, probably the most important feature should have been the face of the dock. Any questions? I think I'm finishing right on time. So for all of these, um, like looking at the top row with the Pomeranian, 
Mm-hmm. B, B is showing the amount of activation for the entire like sum of the channel, or I guess the, the feature channel. Yes. So you're um, right. C, C is showing exactly what the, ch- what the filter looks like, or rather the pixels in the original image, which are then corresponding to the activation of the, f- of the filter. Uh, so this visualization is coming from the VCONF net. And is it, is it a picture of the f- filter or the, the feature in layer five, or is it a, like, I don't understand what the map projections means. Is it, is it a subset of the original image, which is then generating the activation, or is it the filter itself in layer five? Well, let's see what happens. We take the image of the dog, we push it through the convolutions, in a forward fashion up until layer five. Mm-hmm. So now we are at layer five. And while we were doing it, we were storing the switches. Mm-hmm. Now at layer five, we take the strongest feature map, which is gonna be only a matrix. It's not gonna be a tensor. And it's a, it's a matrix whose um, total sum of all the entries is the largest? Yes. Like largest Frobenius norm or something like that, or, or L1 norm? So each pixel is going to give you an activation, activated value. And because you're after the rectifier, most of all of them are positive. Mm-hmm. So you can just take a look at the sum of those values. Got it. And that's a measure to compare how strong that feature is. So it's the feature, it's the feature whose total sum is the biggest. And that's the most activated one. Yes. Okay. So Got that's so the strongest feature map. You take that. It's a matrix or it's a tensor of uh, dimension one at the end. Mm-hmm you store the switches, and then you keep max pooling. You increase the resolution from one layer to the next one, and you use your uh, transpose of the convolutions, and then in the end, you're going to end up with an image. Uh, so you take, you take that, that small dimensional filter and then back propagate it and unpool and unconvolve, and you end up with something of the same dimension that you started with, and then you can visualize it. Exactly. Okay. So this is smart. Now you can visualize it and see where the network is looking at. It's looking at the face of the dog. Got it. Okay. And just and to be clear, right. so B, B and D aren't really showing um, features themselves, it's showing like a distribution of where the location of the filter would be most important within the original image. Yes, so B, D and E are ways for the paper to validate its results. The result is that the face of the dog is the most important part of the image according to the network. And then how are you going to validate it? You can actually have a box, Mm -hmm. slide it over the original image, take a look at the feature map. Yeah, this is cool. And you see the face of the dog is the most important one also. So you're Mm -hmm. using the same uh, conclusion using two different methods. Yeah. Um, In that top image um, where it's like the smaller stride, two versus four, so that's showing all of the first layer's features if you were using A. Like what, what is A versus B versus C versus D in the, in the top right? So in A, these are the top activated ones or a subsample of the most activated ones because you cannot plot all of them in one single plot. And that's the first layer or the, the first layer after the input image yeah. layer. There are 96 of them, but we are plotting, I don't know how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine times. Uh, it might be all of them. Probably it's all of them. Yeah, so there are 96 of them and you're plotting them and you see that some of them are dying mm-hmm. and it's exactly the way that we plotted this. So the same method you're using it to plot those, those features okay. for the first layer. You do the same thing for the next layer which you have 256 of them. I don't know whether these are 256 features, but you do the same thing for the second layer and you visualize them. This is for AlexNet. But then there were some observations that you have dead features, dead feature maps, Mm -hmm. and some values are dominating your features. Same thing here. There are some dead features. And then the paper said the reason is because your filter size is too big and you're striding too big. It's killing, it's a lot of information is destroyed in the first layer. Don't do that. Reduce the stride and reduce your filter size. Cool. And you end up with nicer features. Are A and B showing the same thing, but B is with a like a different stride? Yes. So B is a different network. A is AlexNet, C is AlexNet. 
B and D are the modified Alex. And are C and D still the first layer or is that a deeper layer? Because those, those features yeah. themselves look higher dimensional or more complex. Yeah, this is the second layer. Perfect, okay. The first layer, second layer. Got it, okay. Do you know, is this the first paper to, because this has shown the idea that there's like a hierarchy of features, right? You go from like basic edges to faces. Is this the first paper to really show that? No, actually, Alex Neff showed that. And probably before that, uh, the paper by Jan Lacombe. But they visualize the, the weight. These people are visualizing the actual features. These are not your filters. These are your features. But they came to the same conclusion that the first few layers are focusing on more generic properties of the image. And as you go deeper, it's going to focus on more discriminative features like a dog or a cat. And it makes sense. And is the difference, the difference you're making between visualizing the weights and visualizing the features, when you're visualizing the weights, you would be looking at like one of the dimensions of the tensor at layer five versus doing this back propagation type projection where you're doing the unpooling and the unrectifying and the unconvolutioning. Uh, and then you end up back at an, an image of the original dimension. Is that, is that the distinction you're making between features and weights? Uh, yes. So what is the distinction between features and weights? Weights are these windows that you keep sliding over your image. They have a size of seven by seven by three mm -hmm. by 96. But what is the size of your features? They're going to be, uh, I think after this layer, you're going to end up with 110. Yes, it's 110 by 110 by 96. Got it. So one of them is four-dimensional tensor. This is a three-dimensional tensor. Yeah. So that's the distinction between a weight and a feature. Feature, a feature, feature is like a, a property of the original image that um, causes activation of the certain weights or the certain filter. Actually, the output of any layer is going to give you a feature map. But the internal operations of the layer is going to give you the weights. Got it. Cool. The feature maps is the output of your layer. Any other questions? 